Good evening. Uh, welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. I'm so pleased that you could all be here this evening. Um, this is the labor component of the Labor Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. Um, the Labor Literature and Landmark Lecture Series are supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Uh, I'll just for, I don't know how many of you this is your first visit, but just to give you a little bit of background on the General Society, uh, the Society is a non-profit organization that was founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of the City of New York. Today, this 229-year-old organization continues to serve and improve the quality of life for the people of New York City. It does this in several ways, through its educational, philanthropic, and cultural programs, including its tuition-free Mechanics Institute, the General Society Library, which of course you're in, and its nearly 200-year-old lecture series, of course, of which tonight's event is part of. Tonight's lecture continues that distinguished tradition of lectures and is one of five labor lectures, in fact, this is the fourth, that will provide a behind the scenes look at the creative industries in New York City, focusing on the talented artists that provide the heartbeat of theater, cinema, and cinema. The series is created by Beverly Miller, president of the United Scenic Artists 829, um, and then in, in a few moments, I'm going to introduce you to uh, a colleague of Bev, who is here to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, but I also want to mention at this point that after the reception, after, after tonight's lecture, there'll be a wine and cheese reception that we hope you will stay for. I'm really delighted to introduce to you Carl Mullert of United Scenic Artists 829, who is the Scen United Scenic Artisans business representative for live performance and who's going to introduce tonight's speaker, Beowulf Borat. Carl. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I tend to be very loud, so I'm gonna speak away from this. Uh, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you renowned scenic designer Beowulf Borat, who has been a member of USA since 2002. Is that right? Something like 2002. That. Um, his designs have been hailed as feverishly inventive by the New York Times and visionary by Playbill magazine. Notable Broadway productions have included the Scottsboro Boys, for which he received his first Tony nomination, Rock of Ages, the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, Sondheim on Sondheim, and the currently running Act One at Lincoln Center Theater, which only last week earned him yet another Tony nomination. Congratulations, Barry. Um, he's designed extensively off-Broadway, regionally, and throughout Europe, Asia, and Australia. He has been honored with the Adelco Award, a Barrymore Award, three Drama Desk nominations, and in 2007 was honored with an Obie Award for Sustained Excellence in Set Design. Beowulf's designs are always unique, but most important, he is a true collaborator with his fellow artists, which is, I believe, why he has achieved such recognition. His work never overwhelms the source material. It is always intelligent, witty, and totally supports the play. I've had the privilege of working side by side with Beowulf on the union's Broadway negotiation committee, where he worked tirelessly for the benefit of his union brothers and sisters in order to provide a fair agreement for both the workers and the employers. We thank him for that and for his dedication to the traditions of live theater. But mostly, we thank him for the anticipation, the anticipation of all the future evenings in the theater when the curtain will rise and reveal another brilliant design by set designer Beowulf Borat. Thank you. Hi. I guess I'm loud too. Um, I'm gonna stop blushing and uh, uh, talk a little bit about set design. Um, uh, set design is a transformation of space over time in service of a story. Um, I thought about that for a while, how to start this, and I think people think of set design as a lot of things. It's, it's picking paint colors, it's picking molding, it's picking a chair. 
Um, and all of that is not even secondary, tertiary maybe. It, it's not what it's about. Um, set design for the theater, which is, which is what I do, what I know how to do, um, is, is creating a space, a physical space, that's gonna be inhabited by actors telling a story. And over the course of 90 minutes or two hours or whatever it is, it's gonna change in some way uh, to help support that story. Um, it can be a, a simple transformation. Uh, here's a, a very simple set. I'm gonna go through a series of, of sets. It's, it's all stuff that I've done. I'm not gonna talk about them too much. They're just sort of here as examples. Uh, which, you know, it's a, a living room, kind of as generic a set as you can get. And the change over the course of time is just achieved by light. Um, but again, you can see there's a, a dramatic change there, although nothing physically has changed other than some curtains opening. Um, it can be more complicated and technically involved. Uh, uh, in this play, uh, the set was a, was a blue carpeted box and it was full of a big pile of junk furniture that the actors pulled out as was needed from scene to scene. So in this scene is a, a bedroom scene, but you can see it's a very abstract staging. And the girl in this picture in the course of the play tries to commit suicide in the bathtub. In the course of that, the bathtub begins to overflow and you can see along, along here, water begins to flow across the carpeted floor fills the entire stage um, and ultimately floods the entire stage so that the actors play out the rest of the play ankle deep in water. So it can be a big physical transformation, something very dramatic that way um, that completely changes the space that it's taking place in. And that, that's, to my mind, what a set designer's job is in the theater, is to cre create some kind of a dramatic physical visual transformation. Um, the, the real sense, what creates drama is in the course of a play, the characters change and transform in some way, or the plot has twists and turns and changes and transforms in some way. The physical world has to do the same. Sometimes it's huge dramatic things, sometimes it's very simple things, but it's gotta tell a story and it's gotta support the story that the rest of the play is trying to tell. So how do you figure out what that change is gonna be? The examples I've shown you, some of them are abstract, some of them are, are very kind of simple, realistic things. Um, and to do that, I try to find a concept. I, I always call it the big idea. Some kind of a visual idea that I can grab onto that relates to the theme or to the, the arc of the story. And, and I can support visually with some kind of a, a change. Um, uh, uh, this is one more example of, of sort of a technological transformation before I go into sort of the big idea stuff. This is a, a musical about, Steve, about Stephen Sondheim, um, which had a big uh, documentary component to it. I always called it a, a documentary in the form of a musical. Uh, the first third of it, maybe, was really just video archival stuff of Steve Sondheim and people singing. Uh, so I made a, this enormous video wall out of LCD TV screens, but in the middle of the first act of the play, suddenly that tore apart and the top of it lifted up into the air, and through the rest of the play it kept pulling apart in different ways and reshaping itself in different ways. So again, using technology, using physical space to transform in fairly dramatic, startling ways to, to sort of support the story. Um, but how do you figure out what, what that idea is, what seems appropriate for the play? Um, I'm going to use a Shakespeare play as an example because if you want sort of thematic density, Shakespeare is about as dense as it gets. Uh, for The Tempest, which is certainly one of his densest plays, it's about a thousand things. There's, I could pick almost any theme in there and grab onto that as part of the design and it would be valid in some way. Uh, when I did a production of it, what I decided I would grab onto though, this was a case where I was doing both the scenery and the costumes, so it gave me a little more latitude to, to really control the whole visual picture. I thought it's a story about how a, a group of guys, a, a group of Italians, evil men, are, are captured by Prospero, a good man who they've wronged and ultimately redeemed by him. Uh, so the Shakespeare says the play starts in a ship, um, and this is how I did a ship. Uh, bunch of guys in black suits on a black airplane, which at the end of the first scene disappeared, stranding them on a completely white island full of people all dressed in chalky white. And so you've got these guys dressed all in black, lost in this, this sort of magical wasteland, all in white. And over the course of the play, as the story plays out, 
they begin to transform. The inhabitants of the island have effects on them. The environment has effects on them. They start to lose their civilization, their jackets and ties. Their pants begin to be covered with the chalk of the island. And by the end of it, they've all been sort of broken down uh, and made more elemental by their experience. Uh, another example of, of sort of design, sort of grabbing on, trying to grab onto an idea, to a theme, and express that. It's a musical called The Scottsboro Boys, about nine African-American youths who were in the 30s wrongly accused of, of rape in Alabama, uh, and many of them went to jail for the rest of their lives for it. They were patently innocent, everyone knew they were innocent, and they were scapegoated. And I did a musical a couple years ago based on this, and the, the writers and the director started with the idea of a minstrel show. You, you can't get too much more racist than that, and it was the, yet the most popular form of entertainment in this country for about 100 years. So they took the, the physical form of a minstrel show and told the story of the Scottsboro Boys through that. Uh, we, one of the few defining characteristics physically of a minstrel show is a circle of chairs, is how it always starts. Uh, and so we did this kind of postmodern circle of chairs. We weren't, just try we weren't trying to do a minstrel show, we were trying to kind of riff on that idea. And I built nine chairs out of lightweight aluminum that dancers could move around and, and reshape. And through the course of the play, the Scottsboro Boys tell their story by taking those chairs and building a train car out of them, for example, building a prison cell out of them. Um, and they slowly subvert the form, take over the form of the minstrel show, and ultimately conquer the minstrel show is, is sort of, the, again, the visual theme that we're trying to tell in telling the story. Um, so there's a couple examples of that. Now, uh, now I'm going to move into a play that's running currently uh, to, to sort of track you through an entire show. How do I get these ideas? How do you, how do you figure out what it is? Because as I've said, you can, you know, there's, there's a, a thousand good ideas. There's no sort of right or wrong way to do a play. Maybe there's wrong ways to do it, but there's no single right way to do it. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about Act One that's running on Broadway currently that Carl just referred to. It's, um, it's based on the autobi an autobiography, a memoir that Moss Hart wrote. Uh, for those who don't know, you guys probably know who he is. Moss Hart wrote The Man Who Came to Dinner, You Can't Take It With You, a lot of famous plays from the first half of the 20th century. He was also the original director of My Fair Lady and uh, Camelot, a hugely successful guy. Um, shortly before he died, he wrote this memoir about how he started out in the world. He was born to a couple of English immigrants in the South, in the Bronx, in, in true destitute poverty. Um, and in the course of his early years, he sort of scratched and clawed his way out of that, met George Kaufman, a famous successful playwright director. They wrote a play together and he was on his way. He suddenly you know, had this amazing theatrical career and spent the rest of his life as this sort of incredibly sophisticated writer, director in the New York theater, um, actor occasionally. So the story of act one is this rags to riches story. Um, about a year and a half ago, uh, James Lapine, the writer director who uh, has worked with Steve Sondheim on Into the Woods and Sunday in the Park with George, and who I've done a number of projects with over the years, called me up and he said, I've got a peach for you. I've got a job, but it's really hard. Um, and I had known vaguely he was working on an adaptation of this book. I actually didn't know the book at the time. It's a very famous theater memoir and it had been on my shelf, but I had never read it. So immediately I picked up the book and read it um, and thought, how the hell are you gonna make a play out of this? It's so sprawling. Um, and James sent the, uh, the script over to me and it was 150 pages long, the draft that I read a year and a half ago. For reference, a normal play is probably about 115, 120 pages. So you know that's a play that's gonna run maybe two hours and 15 minutes. At 150 pages, um, it's, it was easily a three hour play. Um, and uh, had maybe 50 locations in the course of it, uh, which again, for a set designer, is, is slightly terrifying. Um, so before I did anything, I read the play, and you know, I thought you, we've all seen plays where they go through lots of places and there's really nothing on stage. Maybe that's the way to do act one. And I sat down with James, uh, and that's, that's always, for me, how everything starts out. I read it, and then I sit and talk with the director. I'm, I'm designing it and I'm creating the world, but it really all has to sort of spring from how the director wants to approach the show. Do we want lots of living rooms? Do we want almost nothing? How do we want to do it? 
And the only thing he really said to me was, it's a story about a young man sort of beating his way up in the world. And I want a sense of that energy of this kid who's running up and down stairs in producers' offices, banging on doors, trying to get ahead in the world, trying to lift himself out of poverty. I see him running up and down a lot of stairs. And that's about all he said when he started. But um, that sense of the, the energy of youth and the excitement of, of a young person trying to make their mark on the world was clearly something we wanted to emphasize in this story. Um, so I sat down and looked at the script again, and as I said, it's a lot of locations. And on a second reading, clearly it wasn't a Shakespeare play. You know, Shakespeare plays have a lot of locations in them, but almost invariably, someone will walk on stage and say, what ho, this is a nice castle. And so as a set designer, I don't have to give you a castle because Shakespeare's already done it. Um, in act one, James didn't do that. People would walk in and the stage direction would say it was a producer's office or it was a hotel room or it was a stage or it was a camp in the Catskills or whatever it was. Um, but there was nothing to indicate what it was in the, in the words. Um, and clearly at 150 pages, I couldn't go in and say, hey, you should add some more words. Um, so it was gonna be up to me in some way to figure out how to, to establish these locations. Um, the play, as I say, called for a lot of things. We needed offices we need, with desks and telephones in them. We needed Moss Hart's tenement, which had to have a kind of a gritty reality to it. If there's no kind of destitution, there's no real rough world that he's coming out of, there's not so much for him to rise to. And George Kaufman's house had to be glamorous and elegant in some way. So all that stuff felt like it was necessary to the telling of the story. The play's written sort of like a Kaufman and Hart play in that you want some kind of realistic locations. It's not, it's not just a poetic, abstract space. Um, so I sat down, made a list of all the locations, all the different things we needed, and it immediately kind of backed me into a corner because one of the things, I don't, I don't tend to say I have a style where I do this, this, or this on every show, but one thing that is important to me is that in the theater, less is more. Movies do a great job of, of showing us huge realistic locations. And in a film, the editor can take you from the Sahara to Siberia in a split second with a cut. On stage, you can't do that. You're moving physical things around. And the most powerful tool we have in the theater is the audience's imagination. If I can put just enough on stage that you imagine George Kaufman's house, it's gonna be more fabulous than anything I can design and put there. And if I can put just enough on stage to give you a sense of the squalor and how cramped and awful Moss Hart's tenement is, again, you're gonna imagine a lot more than I could ever put there. So that is something that I, I don't always adhere to, but I try hard to, uh, to not do too much, to be sort of a minimalist in that way. Um, and yet here I am dealing with this huge play, this huge sprawling thing that requires a lot of stuff. Another technical consideration in figuring out how to stage this big massive play is that it's, it's not written with scenes that last 10, 15 minutes. Most of the scenes are two or three minutes long, and most of them are two or three people. A couple of them are big, but usually it's two guys standing there and they talk for 45 seconds, and then suddenly we're in a different location, and they talk for two minutes, and then we're in another location for another 30 seconds, and then we're in another location for two minutes. And if I take, say, 20 seconds for every one of those scene changes, Suddenly, that's a big percentage of the show that you're sitting and watching the set change. You're not watching the story progress. So in a play like this, if the set takes too long to get from place to place, it can absolutely cripple the story and, and also make the whole experience longer. But it just gets in the way. It's ultimately watching scenery change isn't very interesting. Occasionally, it can be beautiful. But even at its most beautiful, you don't want to watch it 40 times in one night. That's not why you're in the theater. You're there to watch the story. Um, additionally, the Vivian Beaumont Theater at Lincoln Center, which is where we were doing this play, is enormous. It's, I think it may be the third biggest theater in the country. Um, I heard that statistic recently. It's enormous at any rate. It was designed for repertory, um, and it's, it's certainly the biggest Broadway theater in New York. Um, and I had the good fortune to bump into another set designer in the hallway at Lincoln Center soon after I got the job, John Lee Beatty, who uh, won the Tony Award last year for... Um, Oh, God, I'm going to forget the name of the play now and embarrass myself. But um, he's a wonderful guy. He's been doing this for a long time. He's done a lot at Lincoln Center. And I said, John, you've worked here a lot. What can you tell me about the Beaumont? And he looked at me and said, well, it's big. And it takes a long time to get anything from the wings out to center stage. Um, and it's, it's very true. And in any kind of a Broadway theater, I sort of hate watching things come trucking in from the wings. But at the Beaumont, suddenly that distance is twice as, twice as big. And so if I was gonna get all these scenes in and out that way, it was gonna take twice as long. 
um, and clearly that wasn't going to be a good way to solve it. So I've got this interesting conundrum. I've got a big space, I've got short scenes, and, and I've got a short time to get stuff in and out. Um, and physics is against me on this one. Um, so I sat down and started trying to figure out how to do it. And almost always when I start designing a set, ultimately it's going to be a physical space that exists in physical space. So I do it in three dimensions. Uh, I build a model, a scale model, uh, and I'll show you one later on in the, in the evening in a little bit. Uh, but I built a little uh, model of the Viv Vivian Beaumont Theater at a quarter inch to a foot scale, and I started playing with ideas for how to put a set in there. And the first idea I had was, well, it's a story about the theater, so let's do a very kind of theatrical device. I'll do an empty stage, and we'll put some chairs and tables and things out there, and the actors can push them into space. We'll see the actors doing all the work. It'll be very theatrical and very simple. Uh, and I built a model and I called the director and I said, can we have a meeting and let me show you my idea for the show. Um, and the day before that meeting, I was sort of looking at the model that I made and thinking, God, I've done this idea a hundred times. Uh, here's one version of it I did. This is a, an, an empty space. It just looks like an empty theater. In fact, everything up there is scenery. Um, but it's been made to look like it's an empty stage and a story plays out on it. Here's another one that I did, same idea. They work really well. There's a reason that cliches exist. They, they tend to work well. But I thought, this is, an, this is a big Broadway show. I don't want to do the same thing I've done a bunch of times. And I had one of those eureka moments that you always kind of hope for and they don't usually happen. Um, but kind of, truly in a flash, all of a sudden I thought, oh, wait a minute, I know how to solve this play. We've got a big space, let me make one big construction, something that's big enough that it can hold every one of the locations in the course of this play, all 50 of them. And I think by then the play had been edited down, so maybe there were only 40 locations, but there were a lot. But I've got this huge theater that I've got to fill in some way. I want all the individual spaces in it to not be so big. So let me lump them all together and make some big thing that can bring all those little spaces in and out. And what I loved about that idea instantly is that it seems to be very New York to me. This story essentially all takes place in New York. And one of the things I always think walking around the city is everything is jumbled together. There's no design sense to this place at all. You've got some beautiful old building shoved in some next to something awful, next to something brand new, all piled up on top of each other. And there's an incredible kind of kinetic energy in that to me. Uh, every time I see something I love get torn down in New York, it makes me sad, but I sort of think that's what keeps this city so vibrant, is it's sort of constant churning energy of things knocked down, new things coming in, things piled on top of each other. It's what makes the city unique, and certainly in this country. And if I could capture some of that energy in the set, that is also some of the energy of youth, the excitement of this guy trying to get ahead, trying to pile onto things, trying to build his way up, that the play is about, that the play is trying to, um, to express. And I found uh, an artist who I only recently became familiar with, named Martin Lewis, who does these wonderful etchings of New York, Depression era New York, that have always sort of captured this sense to me, this sense of New York sort of piled together on itself. And it also was, as it turns out, great research for the piece because it's a lot of images of these people sort of reaching for something, longing for something like this. Um, so what I sat down very quickly that night, I had a meeting at 10 o'clock the next morning with the director, I stayed up all night, and I built a very, very quick model of a giant turntable, a spinning turntable that would fit on the stage, 75 feet in diameter, three stories tall, and I took my list of all the different places in the show and I crammed them all into it with a lot of little furniture. Um, and it was very rough and crude. I didn't sleep at all, and I went to the meeting the next day. And uh, first I pulled out the bad model, the, the idea of the empty theater that I knew I didn't like, but I thought, let me show it to him, maybe he'll like it. And he looked at it for maybe a minute. He said, well, you got anything else? Um, and probably more disparagingly than that. Um, and then I pulled out the idea that I liked better, and, and he loved it, thank God. Um, and we altered it. We were a long ways from solving the play. but. That was the big idea. That was the moment that kind of cracked it. Uh, and, you know, I wish that staying up all night building a model was the solution to every play I've tried to do. If I could lose a night's sleep and solve them all, I'd be very happy. But um, it doesn't usually work that easily. Uh, it, I, I, I think that is the creative force that we all sort of strive for in things. And I wish I knew how to trigger it. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. But luckily for me on this show, it did. So I'd sold the idea. Um, I sat down and started working up sketches now of, you know, I'd built a very, very rough model, but it wasn't really practical. I had to sit down and think, okay, we, uh, 
you know, the first scene is here, the next scene is here, the next scene is there, but then the next scene's way over here, and we don't want to we don't want to have to take ten minutes to get from one place to the next. So we went through a whole series of sketches like this where I just kept reordering the different pieces of it, trying to figure out how to piece it together so we could go from A to B to C to D, and that we kept any kind of a big move through the space uh, to a minimum so we weren't wasting a lot of time on scene changes. And uh, what, what you're seeing here is, is this big circle flattened out. So this thing turned into a big, uh, a big circular construction that could spin on stage. And I'll show you the model just quickly. This, looking at it from above, is what the set turned into. But as the audience, you see it like this. And I'll talk about this a little bit more, but I'm bringing it out now just because it's always been a hard idea to explain. We would show people this flattened out version, and they wouldn't have any clue what I was talking about, when in fact what it's going to do is function like this and take you from place to place to place this way. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time just trying to figure out uh, how to lay out these different locations. The other catch in all of this is although the script existed, it was a new play. And when you do a new play, they inevitably change a lot. And James Lapine's a playwright who really likes to change things a lot. So he said, you've got to give me the flexibility that if I decide this living room scene is now going to take place in a hotel or in a diner, we can do that. Um, so not only am I trying to provide all these locations, I'm trying to provide them in a way that we're not too locked into them so that if three weeks into previews, he decides he wants to change his scene, I have the flexibility to do that. And the way ultimately we solved that was what I call the pie wedge solution. So this is a, a plan looking down from above, a bird's eye view of the whole set. And I divided it into six pie wedges. Um, uh, one, three, and five, say, of those six wedges became literal spaces that never changed. This was always Moss Hart's tenement, never, never anything other than that. This was always a theater, and we used it for every theater that Moss Hart had a play in over the course of his life, which is quite a few, but it was always a, a sort of a theater set. This is always George Kaufman's fancy mansion. And then between them, here, here, and here, we had three neutral spaces that were two-story spaces that were much more open, that could be a lot of different things. They had windows in them, they had a little bit of architectural detail, but they were generic enough that they, they weren't too specific, and we were gonna be able to keep changing things out by changing the furniture in them or the dressing, set dressing on them to, to make them be different things. And I started working up a model of what we hoped it all would turn into. Uh, that's the model that I just showed you there. Here's a picture of the, the tenement uh, and how that was going to look. It's a three-story thing with the stairwell up the side of it. Here's what the set ended up looking like, ultimately. Here's George Kaufman's house. Again, we devoted a big chunk of real estate to this mansion to make it really big and glamorous, because it's got to be kind of the, the fant fantasy ideal of what a, a rich, successful theatrical impresario would live in. It doesn't look anything like George Kaufman's house really looked, but uh, it was sort of a fantasy of that. Here's the set, the finished set, and what it ended up looking like. Uh, here's this uh, view of the stairwell, again, in the model, uh, showing how that functions. And here's the, fu the finished thing in the final set. So uh, I've jumped into some finished pictures here, but we were far from finishing at this point. Then the reality sets in. We had, we'd actually moved so quickly through all this, we'd sort of come to this idea maybe in May of last year. Lincoln Center hadn't, hadn't quite finished budgeting their season yet, so they hadn't told us what our budget was. And once we had this great idea that we loved, they told me the budget, which wasn't nearly enough money. Uh, it was $500,000, which is a lot of money, obviously, but to do something this big in a, in a Broadway theater costs a lot of money. And people always look at me and say, well, why does a set cost so much? It's just a, it's just a stage set. But if you think about this, the thing is a three-story tall, 3,000-square-foot 3, house that's completely skeletal, has no walls, has to have functional stories, and it's got to spin around 360 degrees in 40 seconds. So that's why it costs what, and it's a custom-made thing. It's not, there's very, there are very few off-the-shelf pieces in this. It's, it's all custom-made stuff because nobody else in the world needs a 3,000-square-foot house that spins in a circle. Um, you've all heard the adage, uh, cheap, fast, good, pick two. Um, and that's sort of the place I was in. And luckily, because we were still, you know, almost a year out from needing the finished set, I had time. I didn't need it to be quick. 
And we buckled down, we started working on technical drawings to, to get this idea fleshed out so that we could go to a scene shop and say, this is what we want to build, this is how much money we have, can you do it? And my hope was that they would say yes, but even if they said no, I was still nine months ahead of time, and if worse came to worse, I could sit down and design a whole new set. So I worked on the model, went through different versions, just making sure we liked the details. Here's a version where we made the whole floor red, which turned out to be a terrible idea, but it was worth looking at quickly, and it's a lot cheaper to do it in a little model than it is to do it on stage. Um, and once we were settled on things, my assistant sat down and started doing all the technical drawings. Um, all two scale drawings that we send out to shops and they look at and this is what they use as a basis for building the set. This is a, a sectional view looking at the stage from one side. Uh, here are some elevations showing Mossart's tenement broken down into pieces so the shops are able to bid on it. Um, you'll see in all of these sketches I'm putting up and in all the model pieces there's always always a little figure, a little person there. That's one of the most crucial things for me, is putting a person in to make sure that I'm dealing with the human scale and the human form, because ultimately everything I'm doing is there to present actors, to make the actors feel important and big enough that they can command the space. And a big challenge with Act One was taking this big theater and making the spaces within it sort of human scale, getting them down to the size that a human being feels important. And granted, I'm doing a three-story tall set here, but hopefully all the pieces within it are human scaled enough that people feel like they're important and feel like they can dominate the, the stage. Um, so, did these drawings, we sent them out to, to scene shops. Ordinarily, what I would do is send them out to five or six scene shops and whoever gives me the best price gets the job. In this case, because we were way ahead of time, the theater said, let's send it just to one place. Let's go to, to a single shop, a place called Show Motion in Connecticut that I had worked with and they had worked with. And it's a place that, of the big Broadway shops, is very good at coming up with kind of cost-effective solutions and value engineering, as we call it. Um, and I spent about a month sort of discussing stuff with them, saying, what if we did it this way? What if we did it this way? Um, initially, my idea was that the entire set was gonna be on what we call a donut. Instead of it being a big disc, the middle was going to be cut out. Because I thought, well, that's less material. It'll be cheaper. Um, as it turns out, it was more complicated to do it that way. And even though it took more material to build a giant turntable, that was the cheaper solution in the end. And so a series of conversations led us to that. And by September, they had said, yeah, we can do this. We can, we can do this for $500,000. We'll build the whole set for you. So, so good. I've solved that one. Uh, the big idea is solved, we've got an idea how to do the show, we think we can stage this show on it, and we found a place that can build it for the money we've got. And now I get into 100,000 little details, and that's sort of the next part of the job of, of a set designer. Um, I, I told you I'd been making lists of all the different scenes and what was in them, what was needed. And on almost every big player musical, I do this kind of a tracking document. It's, it's just an Excel chart, and I list every scene in it what page it is, because that gives me a sense of how long the scene is, what the location is. And in this case, as we moved along, there's, there were pictures of each scene, a plan of each scene, so I know what the set's doing on the stage, and a list of all the props, and often some research as to what all those props need to be. This document was about 45 pages long for this play, um, all of it packed with this much information. And it became our Bible moving along for me, for the stage managers who had to sort of move things through, um, I think less for the director, but for the props people and the carpenters, it allowed everybody to get a sense of what the set was actually going to do in the course of the two, two and a half hours of this play. Early on, I was talking about the transformation of space over time. This is kind of a, a nuts and bolts documentation of what that transformation is going to be. Uh, and every move sort of tracked out so we know what's supposed to happen. Um, and it also led to lots of questions because we had to then, all of these little props and things that are indicated, we had to figure out how to, how to come up with them and make the choice of what they, what they were gonna be. Should George Kaufman have these kind of chairs? Should George Kaufman have these kind of chairs? Should George Kaufman have this chair? And there's sort of endless choices of where to go. This is what we ended up with his, his office looking for. Um, is this what a theater dressing room looks like? Or is this what a theater dressing room looks like? And this is what we ended up with in the end. Again, very simple. The details of it, we tended to sort of get things down to the absolute minimum. I felt like for a theater dressing room, all you really need is some light bulbs and a mirror, and that kind of tells you where you are, uh, and a couple of show posters behind you. 
So again, trying to pare it back to as minimal detail as possible and let the audience fill in the rest and frankly save myself some money in the process. So rehearsals start. Now, now we've come around to January of this year uh, and rehearsals are starting on the show. Um, and we get into all sorts of different questions because now we've got actors involved. Now it's not just me and the director talking about what we'd like it to be. We've got all the people who are actually going to deal with these chairs and tables and things and they have opinions on what it ought to be. And this is too heavy and this is too big and this is too small and this isn't what I think this character would have. Um, and we get into a lot of discussions like that. In rea there was a uh, a big chunk of Act One where they're performing the Emperor Jones, the e e Eugene O'Neill play. This is what the Emperor Jones throne looks like, looked like in the real original production, but it wasn't really practical for the way we were doing the show. So this is what we ended up with because we needed actors to be able to carry the thing around. Um, Moss Hart's very first play that he ever wrote was called The Beloved Bandit, and in the book he describes it as an awful play, and I think it's not even the real title because he didn't want people to be able to find, to find it. Um, and he describes the production of it, which was a disaster, and says it had the ugliest green set in the world. And so in the stage directions for the play, it said, we see the ugliest green set in the world. Now, when I'm not trying to design an ugly set, it seems to be very easy to do. But when I need to design an ugly set, it gets harder. Um, so this was my first stab. It's, the set is supposed to be a Western saloon, and I thought, well, let me just lump everything together and put a bunch of clashing shades of green, and that'll be ugly enough. Or maybe I can split it into pieces, and it'll be a bunch of separate flats, and that'll be ugly. And the director, for the first time ever, said, well, that's a little more tasteful than I'd like. Um, <laughs> so for my next stab, I went to the art store, and I got a, a batch of kids' poster paint. I got the crappiest paint I could find, and I got a really awful paintbrush. And I sat down, and I tried to paint a backdrop using just the wrong tools and came up with this thing. And this, finally, we decided was at least ugly enough that it looked like it had been painted by an amateur and didn't, who didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> And there it is on stage. That's essentially what ended up in the show uh, on a piece of canvas. So every time the actors touched it, it flopped around and moved, and the doors break off halfway through the scene. Um, so we're in rehearsal. We're sort of prepping all this stuff. The set's being built at the scene shop this whole time. Here's a series of pictures of it being built. These are all of the floor pieces laid out. The entire set is made to look like it's a bunch of big wooden beams, and in fact, all of it is steel. It's five inch by five inch steel tubing, um, and incredibly heavy. But that was the way to make it all really sturdy and yet really structural at the same time. So it's all framed out and built in steel. And then slowly assembled, starts going up all three stories. In fact, the shop ceiling wasn't quite tall enough, so we couldn't put the top of the third story on, but most of the set was in place. And one of the more incredible moments for me is this was being built. I went up to visit it one day, and we were getting to the point where the, the set start, had to start coming apart and going down to the theater. And the first thing they wanted at the theater was the big turntable, this enormous thing, which was going to take a couple weeks to assemble in the theater. But the set wasn't done. The set that they were building on top of it wasn't finished yet. I hadn't finished painting it. So I got to the shop. The entire set, which weighed 30,000 pounds, had been put on chain hoists and lifted up to the ceiling of the shop. It's hard to tell in this picture, but it's floating three feet in the air here. 70,000 pounds of it with 30, 30 painters climbing around on it, painting all the steel to make it look like wood, while the turntable gets disassembled out from underneath it to be shipped down to New York. Um, and my assistant, my props guy, and I climbed up into this thing, and it was sort of swaying like a cruise ship or something from the ceiling. And I yelled down to the head of the shop, and I said, are you sure your ceiling can support this? It was also the middle of the winter, so there was about three feet of snow on the roof to boot. Um, and he said, those trusses are fine. They'll hold anything. And in fact, they did. Um, so the set gets brought down, completely disassembled in dis into pieces that can fit in the back of a truck, brought down to New York, brought in through the loading door, all reassembled on the stage of the Vivian Beaumont Theater. And now we get to the technical rehearsals. Um, this is where the, the shit really hits the fan, pardon me. Um, this is where all these ideas come together. The actors have been rehearsing for several weeks now. They've learned their lines. They've learned where they're supposed to go, but it's all just been taped out on the floor in a rehearsal room. They haven't dealt with the real set yet. Suddenly, they're moving onto this thing, onto three, this thing three stories tall, full of staircases. And all this stuff they've been learning to do, they have to do in real time and space now. And we have to add in all the lighting cues and all the sound cues, and they have to start putting on costumes, figuring out where to do their costume changes. And on any show, it's probably, it's for me at least, but I think for most people involved, it's the most intense time. I'm in there from eight in the morning till midnight almost every day. We come in at eight in the morning for about four hours. There's sort of technical work where the carpenters can fix things, painters can paint things. 
whatever. We can refocus lights. And then at noon, the actors come in. From noon to midnight, we go through the show very minutely, you know, sort of moment by moment, working out every detail. And everybody learns what, what they're going to do from moment to moment in the course of the play. And for something like Act One, where, there's, where the set's sort of in constant motion, and there's so many scenes, and so many scene changes, and so many costume changes, it was, a, it was a difficult, grueling time for everybody, and it becomes just kind of an endurance test to see if you can make it through this period. We did this for about two weeks, and it's also where you discover whether the things you thought would work really work. Um, there's a chunk in the middle third of the first act of this play where we went through nine locations in 15 minutes. And the way the set was set up, I told you, we had these neutral spaces where things had to swap out. So in one moment, we're in a producer's office here. We go away for 40 seconds and come back, and it has to be this producer's office. We go away for another 40 seconds and come back, and it has to be this producer's office. So while we're 10 feet away doing another scene in a different part of the set, four props guys and two stage managers, all dressed in black with no light, sneak in and change out all of the dressing on this. At the same time, while these producer scenes are playing out, the theater starts out like this, then it turns into this, then it turns into this, then it turns into this. All of this is over the course of about 15 minutes in the play in sort of constant action with the turntable constantly moving. And the first time we did it, predictably, it was a disaster. It was hugely noisy. Every piece of furniture that moved, we could hear it crashing. You could see flashlights everywhere. And half the time, the turntable would spin back around downstage, and there'd be four props guys caught in the light, and they'd all go run and hide. Um, so at the end of the night, we said, we'll come in at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning without the actors. We'll rehearse all of this. We'll run through all of it. We'll make sure we can do it. We'll do it with a stopwatch. We know how long each scene is, and we'll figure it out. And for four hours, we pounded away at it, and I felt pretty good about it. And the director came in at noon, and I said, we've cracked it. We can run that sequence. We just got to run the whole 15 minutes straight through, no stopping, and we'll, we'll have done it for you. We ran it, and it was a disaster. <laughs> Crashing, banging, things missing, props guys showing up on stage. It was a mess, um, and uh, we did it again the next morning. Uh, I, I think I went to the director after the second disaster, and I said, I'm going to throw up in the, in the garbage can in the lobby like Moss Hart. It's a famous scene in the play where Moss Hart, when his play is first produced, goes and throws up in the lobby, and James just looked at me and said, you don't have that luxury. Um, <laughs> So, and we just kept pounding at it. And a lot of it is just rehearsal for the, for the props guys who are you know, true professionals. It was a matter of them just getting it enough into their muscle memory that in 30 seconds they could run in in the dark and do all these changes and get off again silently. And by the third or fourth time through, they'd figured it out and we'd cut a couple of pieces of extraneous furniture that we didn't need and said, oh, well, we can use this chair in all three scenes instead of trying to use three different chairs and some things like that and got it worked out. But again, that's what the tech process is. It's figuring out all of those details 100 times over how you make it all work. And because the set, as you can see, is very skeletal, you can tend to see through it. There's nothing really blocking us from seeing that those changes going on generally. It's just that we keep it dark in this part of the stage, and everyone's wearing black and trying to be very quiet. Um, and that takes some time to figure out and to sort out. So after two weeks of this, finally we hit our first audience. And I think literally we had run the show from beginning to end once before an audience came in. Um, and it's, it's not so unusual that that happens, but it's nerve wracking when you've got a, this big massive play with a thousand things that can go wrong. And you've rehearsed a lot of the pieces very intensely, but you haven't run the whole thing as, as one big thing. The first preview lasted three hours and five minutes which is a really long play, um, and it was way too long. And some of that was scene changes, some of it was, was you know, just too many scenes. And so for the next three weeks in previews, our job was to get the thing shorter, because what you might enjoy at two and a half hours, you're not gonna enjoy if it's three hours. And James went in and started cutting scenes. And so suddenly, where I had 30 seconds to do a scene change, because there was a scene going on, suddenly there's no scene there anymore. And I've got to figure out a way to do the scene change where there's no time. Or suddenly, the scene that used to take place in a hotel room is now taking place in a diner. And with about 12 hours notice, I've got to get rid of a hotel room set and come up with a diner set from somewhere and put that onto the stage. Um, or, you know, some of it was driven by me. Some of the scene changes, we just could never get quiet enough. It was always too noisy because the change had to happen during a really quiet moment in the play. And some of those I solved by saying, well, either you can add some writing here, or you can add something noisy here, or maybe we do the scene like this instead. Instead of it being this kind of a hotel, we make it this kind of a hotel, and this is quieter things that I can bring in. 
it becomes a very collaborative process that way, and everybody's working at it. The, and the actors, of course, are performing this every night in front of an audience, and it's a little bit different every time they deal with it, because now a scene's gone, or now this is a different chair, or you know, this thing is showing up at a different place than it used to. And after several weeks of that, finally you, you get through the whole show, and, uh, and you, you open the thing. But that's sort of from beginning to end what my process is as a set designer. Here's a final sketch that just shows the same set again. You probably don't remember that original sketch very much. It's very much the same ideas, but the details of it all is, is all very, very different. And I'm just quickly gonna show you a little video. Uh, I hoped I could have something to actually sort of show you the set in motion. And I'm afraid Lincoln Center didn't have anything that I could really use for that. But this shows it sort of. So um, that's essentially the presentation. I, they had asked me to talk just a little bit about how I became a set designer. Um, so let me talk just quickly about that. And then I was also asked to talk a little bit about how someone might become a designer if that's what they wanted to do. Uh, so I'll talk just for a few minutes about that and then I'll take some questions if anybody has any questions. Um, and after saying I'm gonna talk about how I became a set designer, I'm not sure I fully know the answer. Um, my, uh, my grandmother, who's 99 now, was always very artistically in inclined. She went to Wellesley in the 30s, and she designed sets for the school plays when she was in college. Um, I don't think she told me that till after I became a set designer, but she always encouraged me artistically. She always encouraged me to paint or, or to do things. And frankly, my parents were always very supportive. My mother, uh, studied opera in college, sang a little bit professionally uh, when I was very young, and that was kind of my first exposure to the theater. She was in the chorus of the Memphis Opera when I was a kid, and the first theater really that I saw was watching dress rehearsals of my mother singing in the, in the opera. And I remember being, she took me backstage at Verdi's Macbeth um, during a scene change, and the set was these big kind of Stonehenge rocks that were, I don't know, I remember them as 20 feet tall, and this guy just walked out on stage and pushed one across the stage, and I was flabbergasted by it, and re remember it vividly. Um, so maybe that's why I became a set designer. Um, I think the real truth of it is I, was, I liked to draw as a kid, and at some point in grade school I did the school play, and I thought that was fun. Um, and when I was in high school, I, I worked as an intern one summer at a little summer stock theater in, in Pennsylvania where we lived at the time, and there was a set designer, and I realized that there was a job that entailed something artistic and something to do with the theater where I could sort of put those two things together, and probably that's really when I decided to do it. I, uh, I went to college and got a drama degree, a really more of a literature-based degree, and uh, as part of that, my college set design teacher said, well, you should go to New York, you should go to NYU. And I really didn't think I was gonna pursue a professional career. And my, my father was a college professor, and I think I was maybe just not inventive enough to think I could do anything else, so I thought I might be a college design professor. 
but I needed to get a master's degree to do that, so I came to New York University. And frankly, the, the best thing about that, I learned a lot there, was that it put me in the middle of New York, and I saw a lot of theater. And I, uh, while I was there, I started designing little shows around New York City. The first job I had in New York was doing costumes for a production of Titus Andronicus in a 75-seat theater in the South Bronx. And uh, for years after that, I worked at that little theater. It doesn't exist anymore, but up in the Arthur Avenue section of the Bronx, there was this little place where we really did some magical shows, and a couple of them got picked up commercially and came downtown, and that kind of launched a downtown career for me. And, uh, and then a series of, of good luck, frankly, um, more than anything. Uh, I think anyone who has any kind of success in the theater says that there's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of passion, but there's a lot of luck. There's a lot of very hardworking, passionate people who are not successful in the theater. And uh, it's being at the right place at the right time and you can't really control that. Um, what else? I, I get maybe twice a month, someone who's just come out of school will drop me an email and say, can I come meet you? I wanna be a set designer. And when I was young, I, when I first moved to New York, I looked, I didn't really know anybody, but I looked up the couple of vague connections I had. There was a, a Broadway set designer at the time who'd gone to Vassar where I went to college many years before me. And we really had no connection other than the same alma mater, but I looked her up and she was nice enough to give me an hour of her time. And one or two other people I got in touch with in similar ways. And I've always felt like I, you know, people were nice to me that way and told me a couple of useful things. And so whenever someone gets in touch with me, I try very hard to, you know, to take a half an hour and just talk to them a little bit. Um, but I never really know how to tell people to start out. You know, I can, I always say what I did, which is I went out and got little jobs in little theaters and I got lucky and they turned into bigger jobs in bigger theaters. I think the more traditional approach and, and what I learned in graduate school but did not do was to become an assistant designer and to go work for someone who is established and successful. And I think that works well for people too. I frankly was a terrible assistant. Uh, I just wanted to do my own things and I maybe had too much ego to do that. Um, and I probably could have learned a lot of useful stuff had I done it. When I did my first Broadway show, it was literally the first time I'd ever worked on a Broadway show. Uh, so I never had the experience of seeing it without that pressure on me. And I. Luckily, I was working with a bunch of great people who sort of helped me through the process. But I think that's more of an apprenticeship like that is maybe more the tradi traditional approach to it. But as I say, I, uh, a teacher early on told me, if you want to be a set designer, you have to design sets. And that was the approach that I took. I just, uh, I did everything that came along and in you know tiny little theaters or any place. And I, in those days, I built all my own scenery. I'd paint it. I'd, build the props, I knew how to weld once upon a time, uh, and I could do all of that. And, you know, I, I got lucky, frankly, and one thing led to the next. Um, the whole time I was working on Act One, I kept giggling to my assistant and saying, never again in my life is someone gonna let me do something like this. This is ridiculous, a 60-foot diameter, three-story thing that spins around through the entire show. It, there are very few plays that call for that kind of set. There are very few directors who who want to work on that kind of a set, and there's very few theaters that would let me do it. Um, and uh, so I guess that's my, my end of my presentation, is just feeling very lucky to, to have a chance to do this, and that's what I, I try to share with people when they, uh, when they come talk to me about it. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. Did the Beaumont Theater have a pivot already in the stage for it to use, or did you have to no, drill every, a hole? No, everything was built for it. Um, you once had to upon drill a, a hole in the stage and, and put um, it It's in. not even. We build the whole thing up. Uh, the, the, the stage deck, as it exists for our show, is about 12 inches higher than the natural stage deck in there. Um, and that's true of most Broadway shows that you see. Every time you see mechanical things moving around the stage, almost all of that's laid in on top of the existing theater deck. Uh, the turntable alone for Act One weighs 70,000 pounds because it's so big um, and it's got so much in it. And there's, there are 126 individual lights that are controlled on that turntable. And all the wiring and all the cabling for all of that has to run up through the floor of this turntable through the middle uh, um, and then be run up the, the insides of these steel posts to control all the lighting and all of the speakers and things that are on the set. My question is, uh, I, I had a friend who said, saw it, 
the first thing he said was commented on how magnificent the set was. Not the acting, not the script, how magnificent the set is. And I said, you know, when it's done at the Vivian Beaumont, do you think they're going to move it to Broadway? And he said he had no idea how it could possibly be done given the set. So mm -hmm. is there the possibility that after this run it would move, but under some drastically changed physical I think it's structure. unlikely. I, um, it, we, we would have to redo the entire, there literally is not another theater in New York other than the Metropolitan Opera where it could, maybe Radio City, where it could fit. Um, and you know, commercial theater is a strange beast. I think it's, I love the play and it's, we've gotten a lovely reaction to it, but I do think it's a very New York play. It's not the kind of thing that is gonna be a, a big tourist draw. Um, and that's really what it takes to drive a big commercial Broadway show. So if there is any intention of moving it to another theater, no one's mentioned it to me yet. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I guess I have two questions. One is, it seemed like the, arch uh, the drawings were architectural. So, so you have to have an architectural background to do stage settings? It's essentially the same. Yeah, it's not, I would say the, the the drafting, the technical drawings that I do are not as sophisticated as what an architect would do, but it's a similar training. I, the basic training is very similar, um, and I, I have those conversations with architects. I don't need to obviously understand wind shear and you know earthquakes yeah, yeah. and that kind of thing, but I do have to have a kind of a basic structural understanding. The shops that I work with are really the guys who do the engineering. I've got to understand it enough to design something that can be built, and then they'll figure out how to actually build it. And if I design something that's utterly impossible, they'll let me know. And what's going to happen to the set when it when the show ends? Um, it gets thrown away. That's, really? That's what there's been some movements in theater to to try to create a stockpile or something so that things don't get wasted. And a lot of designers will will keep bits and pieces of things that we might be able to reuse. Lincoln Center is actually fantastic. The props and all of that stuff gets saved. And in fact, a lot of the furniture in the in the Act One set is from other Lincoln Center productions. That was one of the ways I economized is I thought, well, it's a tenement, it's gotta have crappy furniture in it, but you know, this crappy furniture is as good as that crappy furniture. Um, so that kind of thing gets reused, but as I said, it's a custom-made thing. It's even if somebody needs to do a big turntable again, it probably won't be the exact same size. Um, bits and pieces will go back to the shop. The, the sort of center of the whole turntable will go back to the scene shop that built it, and they'll keep it and use it on other productions. Um, but a lot of it will just get thrown away, which is unfortunate, but it, what we find is when you save it, you put it in storage, it just doesn't get reused. I, I can't tell you the number of sets I've had that go into a trailer and they sit there for a year, and at the end of a year when the lease for the next year comes up on the storage space, the producer calls me and says, well, we're gonna throw it away now. So it, it very seldom gets reused, unfortunately. Can it be recycled, some of the items, or that's not part of the... I don't know that it would, I, I suppose maybe you could. I mean, you it's some, about metal, right? Yeah, it, it, but you'd need to, it's, the, it's metal that's been made to look like wood, so it's got layers and layers of paint and, and things on it. I think you maybe could scrape all that off, and maybe it does end up in a scrapyard. I don't know, for all I know, it gets shipped to China and gets recycled there, um, but I, I don't know the details of it. I, I have one more question. Yeah. You, uh, in the Shakespeare uh, photograph that sh you showed, you said, well, you put them in costumes of uh, suits. Mm -hmm. Now, did you make that choice, or? I did in that case. I, um, again, it, this is part of, I guess, my sort of minimalist sense. I find that putting people in doublets and pumpkin hose and all of that tends to get in the way of my watching a play. And my reaction when I do costumes is to strip it down and make it as simple as possible. And, and it's not everybody's cup of tea. And in fact, on that production, at, at least one reviewer didn't like it and thought that we should have done it in, in Shakespearean period. But, but a set designer does costumes? Not usually, no. I do both. I, I had training in both, so I do both occasionally. All right, well thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. I would like to thank Beowulf so much for participating in our lecture series and to say, I just feel like tonight, after hearing your talk, we should all now instantly go to Act One. Don't you, don't you, I don't know how many people here have actually seen it, but it just seems, seems the most 
tremendous production, and, and, I, and I can't personally wait to see it. Go see it. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I want to say we have just been, it's been fantastic to see you, you've literally embodied the word creative. I mean, your, your work is inspired and I think we all will look with great interest to see what you do in the future. So thank you so very much. Um, in the meantime, we'd like to give you something to remember us by. And then like Victoria Dangle, the executive director, is going to present this. Beowulf, on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, thank you for your brilliant presentation uh, to us. So we're giving you this certificate. And also, we want you, we would like you to come back as a member of our library. So we're giving thank you, you library so membership. Thank you so and Meg, much. Meg, go ahead. And this is Meg Stanton, our program <laughs> assistant. Hello. And this is a little memento that Beowulf could always remember. <laughs> His lecture here. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for coming. I want to mention that our final lecture in the series will feature um, Tom Stein uh, talking about Broadway theatres, and that I will take place, I believe, on Tuesday, June 3rd, so I encourage you to come back for that. In the meantime, I do hope you will stay for a glass of wine and cheese, and I'm sure Beowulf will probably answer a few more questions. So thank you very much.